British Nationality Irish Citizens Bill, as amended in committee, to be considered. No amendments on consideration. Third reading, what day? No. Mr Gavin Robinson. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. I beg to move that we, the bill be now read a third time. Mr Deputy Speaker, yesterday, just yesterday, I was asked by a constituent, what relevance or role does a backbench MP have? And God love that woman, Mr Deputy Speaker, because not only did she get the full presse of my contribution this afternoon, she got all the intricacies of the processes and the procedures and the hoops that we go through to make an impact. Uh, but, but make an impact <laughs> we have. And I think this session and the bills that uh, were not only progressed today to third reading, but bills that I have had the privilege of hearing about and contributing to over the last uh, number of months to see the impact that they can have and the importance that they will make in the lives of ordinary people in our country. It cannot be overstated. Uh, so whilst there isn't an awful lot of awareness of this process or indeed much coverage of this process, uh, I genuinely uh, appreciate that it is there and genuinely appreciate the role that we can play uh, as backbench MPs in making a difference to our country. This British Nationality Irish Citizens Bill, Mr Deputy Speaker, um, has been long in duration, long in gestation. I think the Library were able to dig out references initially from 1985 when this issue was first brought before the House of Commons. And here we are today hopefully in a position that if this House consents to third reading and we can get on to the subsequent stages uh, in the other place, an opportunity to make a difference for 31,000 citizens within Northern Ireland for whom this would benefit, uh, but across the United Kingdom, over a quarter of a million citizens who could take the opportunity to benefit from what I have described through parliamentary process as the final piece in a long constitutional jigsaw. To go into some of the history, Mr De Deputy Speaker, just for completeness, for the last 224 years, the island of Ireland and the island of Great Britain have been one. They were connected in 1800, commenced in 1801 through the Acts of Union, and the lives of our citizens have been intertwined ever since. In 1921, when the island of Ireland was partitioned, the rights of citizens across the island to attain and hold and cherish their British citizenship pertained. The Irish Free State was held, held dominion status within the British Empire, and anyone born within the Irish Free State was still entitled to and many enjoyed British citizenship. That came to an end in 1948 with the British Nationality Act and with the creation of the Irish Republic in 1949. And it is at that point that people born in the Irish Republic, but who subsequently moved, who subsequently have spent the remainder of their uh, lives living in, building families through, and working in the United Kingdom, and from my perspective in Northern Ireland, they haven't been able to enjoy the same privileges that were open to their forefathers, to my forefathers. And so whilst we often talk about the clash between identity and citizenship on these islands, Mr Deputy Speaker, the one piece of the puzzle that has been absent following the Good Friday Agreement when uh, individuals of an Irish identity living in Northern Ireland were freely able and available to attain Irish citizenship, the same has not been true for those born in the Irish Republic but who live in and enjoy and work through the United Kingdom. And that's the essence of this bill, Mr Deputy Speaker. And to bring it alive, consider uh, my colleague from the other place, Lord Hay, an individual who was born in Donegal in 1950. He was born 15 months after the creation of the Irish Republic, but he has lived almost the entirety of his life in Londonderry in Northern Ireland. 
He has been a public servant in Northern Ireland, in the United Kingdom, for almost 50 years. He joined the Northern Ireland Assembly in 1998. He became the Speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly in 2007. He stepped down as Speaker of the Northern Ireland Assembly in 2014 and became a legislator in this place. He is a peer of our realm, but he doesn't have British citizenship. And the idea that somebody like that, who has lived almost the entirety of their lives within our country, contributing entirely through public service to our country, working in our country, paying taxes to our country, and positively changing lives in our country, the idea that they, ignoring the history of our relationships, our intertwined relationships between our two islands, the idea that somebody like him would have to apply for naturalisation, would have to satisfy a life in the UK test, would have to prove that he can speak English. When he is sitting in our parliament, legislating for our country really does highlight the nonsense. Now, Mr Deputy Speaker, I will not allow you to drag me into questioning the ability of members in the far-flung parts of our, of our community in Northern Ireland and their ability to speak English. Right? The, the Belfast accent and the Londonderry accent is not the same, but it is English nonetheless. <laughs> so he provides that really good, tangible example as to why uh, this is a nonsense. We know, we know that anybody uh, born within our islands benefits from a common travel area. We know that anybody who holds Irish citizenship is freely able to work anywhere within the United Kingdom. They are freely able to study anywhere within the United Kingdom. They are able to vote anywhere within the United Kingdom. They can benefit from education and health care. But the final piece is citizenship. They are not the same as somebody uh, from another country in a far-flung place simply because of our intertwined relationships and our history. And so from 1985, the parliamentary efforts to redress this issue have continued. My colleague, the Honourable Member for East Londonderry, was elected to this place in 2001, and he has been campaigning on this issue since 2001. The Lord Hay and the other place, having joined uh, the House of Lords in 2014, has been campaigning on this issue since 2014. And here we have the opportunity to finally put that final piece in the jigsaw. Mr Deputy Speaker, I've indicated 31,000 people eligible in Northern Ireland could benefit from this. Uh, 260,000 across the United Kingdom eligible and could benefit from this. When I started uh, the Private Members Bill process, my focus was on assisting those in Northern Ireland, those predominantly from the three counties uh, of Ulster that are no longer in the United Kingdom but have since moved across the border. Um, in fairness, in fairness, it was the government that opened the door further. The Conservative and Unionist government that opened the door further and said this doesn't need to be constrained to Northern Ireland alone. This should apply across the United Kingdom. I've never been resistant to that, but I recognise the constrained nature of private members' bills. So, Mr Deputy Speaker, I was delighted that through uh, earlier stages we were able to expand at committee the import of this bill that it truly applies across the United Kingdom to over a quarter of a million people, including the London Irish, uh, and many interspersed throughout our communities and our constituencies. It's a great boon. We have benefited in the parliamentary processes around this aspiration of significant cross-party support, not just from the Conservative Party, but from the Labour Party at every uh, intervention uh, and opportunity that I have had to raise this. The Labour Party have been a lockstep with us, and I'm grateful for that. Go back to 2009, Mr Deputy Speaker, whenever a great friend of Northern Ireland and the former Member of Parliament for Thurrock Labour's Andrew McKinley addressed this point, and he said, we have an opportunity which this House will probably not have again for some years to right a wrong, provide parity of treatment for people who are Irish, and allow them to identify as British. Let me say it again, which the House will probably not have again for some years. He was right. 
The House wasn't able to land the opportunity in 2009, but some 15 years later, I think this is a wonderful opportunity for us to seize. The Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee, Mr Deputy Speaker, issued a report back in July 2021, that's HC158, and they considered all of these issues. They took evidence from the Lord Hay, and they concluded that a citizenship test for individuals like him, individuals who find themselves in this situation, would not only be irrelevant, it would be offensive. That was the Northern Ireland Affairs Select Committee report to this House, and I'm glad that the Government have taken heed of that approach. During the passage of this Private Members' Bill, there has been a continual discussion around fees. There is, to my mind, absolutely no reason that somebody who is born on these islands, who benefits already from all of the entitlements that you and I benefit from, Mr Deputy Speaker, should have to pay £1,580 to benefit from citizenship of a country that they've contributed to all their lives. Uh, and the government are well aware of my position on this. There should be no need for anything over and above or additionally added to the cost of a passport. But in fairness to the government, I recognise that it's not part of this bill, that a fees order would have to come se uh, separately and subsequently. And in fairness to the government, they have been very proactive on this issue and have been very open to a discussion which would consider something far short, far short of that which is required uh, today. And I am grateful um, for the engagement that they have had with me in that regard. Mr Deputy Speaker, no citizenship or life in the UK test, a considerably reduced fee, an opportunity for us as a nation to embrace our nearest neighbours, individuals that are part of our families, part of our lives, but for whom the process required of them was just a step too far. Nothing about this uh, bill is coercive, but it opens the door and a wonderful opportunity, I think, for us as a nation to recognise our nearest neighbours uh, and bring them closer still. It is something that has been campaigned for for 40 years. It is something that has many false dawns in this Parliament. It is something that, in 1998, with the Belfast Agreement, we saw the opportunity missed to redress the balance. When Irish nationality was offered to those in Northern Ireland who are born and naturalised as UK citizens, that we could have the opportunity to afford the same courtesy to those on the other side of the border. And with that, Mr Deputy Speaker, I am delighted uh, with the way in which the Home Office have engaged in this issue. The Minister, most particularly for Immigration, who has been a joy to engage with uh, over the last number of months on this issue, um, I'm sorry he isn't here today to see the final stage, and I, I suspect that he is sorry too. Yes. Um, he is sorry too. Uh, but he has a most able substitute today, uh, the Security Minister, um, most able, somebody who um, has thoughtfully engaged on these issues around Northern Ireland and Ireland and the United Kingdom uh, for many a year, somebody that we have huge regard for. So if ever there was somebody to be here on behalf of the Immigration Minister, I'm delighted it is the Security Minister and he is able to respond on behalf of Government. Mr Deputy Speaker, it's a great opportunity, wonderful opportunity for the people of our islands to unify, to strengthen bonds, to get official and national recognition of the ties that bind us together. Something that doesn't need to have discord and hasn't had discord. I mentioned Labour earlier. I should have mentioned that my constituency neighbour, the Honourable Lady for South Belfast, um, was pleased to be a part of the Public Bill Committee, um, has been totally supportive, as has uh, the Member of Parliament for North Down in the Alliance Party as well. So thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Um, if I have leave of the House, uh, I'll probably have a few more thank yous. Uh, but having this opportunity um, in this way to progress most substantively a 40-year-long campaign is so wonderfully appreciated by me uh, and I hope will be benefited by so many across our country. The question is that the bill be now read the third time. Sir Christopher Joe. 
Mr Deputy Speaker, just to put on record uh, my congratulations to the Honourable Gentleman and his uh, friends for their persistence. And I think uh, the bringing of this bill today up for third reading with the support of the government and the opposition is a testament to uh, what can happen in this place if people persist. I can remember, M Mr Deputy Speaker, chairing a, a session in Westminster Hall uh, where the Honourable Gentleman and some of his friends were putting the pressure on uh, our right honourable friend, the member for uh, Wickham, and basically our right honourable friend was unable to respond coherently to the pertinent points which were being made. And no doubt that is, uh, is one of the reasons why his bill has now gained success, because he has successfully cross-examined ministers into the ground on this, and they've been unable to respond uh, coherently. And so many congratulations to him. Sarah Brickler. Thank you, uh, Deputy Speaker. I would like to congratulate the Right Honourable Gentleman, the member for Belfast East, in bringing forward this important bill, which I welcome and I am very happy to support. The bill highlights the closeness of the relationship both between the island of Ireland and the United Kingdom. It addresses the problem that somebody born in the Republic of Ireland who is free to travel work and vote across the United Kingdom is still required to undertake a citizenship test when applying for British citizenship. It's an oversight that can be easily made to assume that an Irish citizen living in anywhere in the United Kingdom, but especially Northern Ireland, would already be entitled to British citizenship, especially given the uniqueness of our relationship and the close social, cultural and historical ties we have. So I therefore welcome this bill, which removes a legal technicality and simplifies the process for Irish citizens wishing to officially become British citizens. But I would just like to ask of the Minister how this might operate in reverse. So whilst I do welcome this bill, I'd just some clarification from the Minister on how that would work. Shadow Minister, Mr Norris. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. It's a pleasure to speak on behalf of the opposition today. I congratulate the Right Honourable Member for Belfast East for his success in the ballot and for navigating his bill uh, through second reading, through committee and hopefully through these stages uh, very shortly. And um, as we heard a little bit in the, in the previous debate, legislating via the private member's route is a tricky art and anyone who reaches this stage deserves our credit. I know that the Right Honourable Gentleman has spoken at previous stages about his good fortune, and doubtlessly that is part of the process. But I think I thought when I was reading those that he was selling himself short to some degree as well. It is no mean feat to find an issue that is compelling, that is relevant, and that you are able to build support around from across uh, this place. I think that's really part of the alchemy of a private member's bill, and he has passed all those tests uh, with this bill, and he deserves full credit for that, because in those elements there is no fortune at all. Uh, and as my uh, front bench colleagues have put on record previously, uh, we as the opposition are very pleased to support this bill, and I'm very pleased to reiterate that support today. And it's a straightforward bill, but one which I know will be appreciated by many, many people. Indeed, following the Belfast Good Friday Agreement and the process put in place uh, to ensure that those from Northern Ireland who wish to gain Irish citizenship would be able to do so, I think many would be surprised to learn that reciprocal arrangements were not in place to ensure that Irish citizens had a route to British citizenship if they so wished. Uh, and we can thank, of course, the Right Honourable Member for Belfast East, but as he has done, those who have come before him over not just years, but actually in this case many decades, four decades, uh, those campaigners, we thank those campaigners for both putting it on the agenda and pushing for change, as the Honourable Member for Christchurch says, using each and every device to push them persuasively. That is a real model uh, for an effective uh, campaign. And it is right that long-term residents of Northern Ireland or the UK as a whole, for, ma for that matter, I think we should recognise uh, the government's wisdom in making that suggestion and change during this process. But it is right that those people uh, who are Irish citizens and wish to be recognised as citizens of the UK, then they should have that right to do so. And on that central point, as I say, I reaffirm the opposition's support uh, for the Right Honourable Member's Bill. And it is, again, and I pay tribute both to the Right Honourable Gentleman and to the Government as well for their wisdom in this area, that there need not be uh, a citizenship test in this case. Um, I'm a strong believer 
Um, and I dare say, actually, the minister may say uh, that, that this is not always true because in opposition we love to point out exceptions to rules. But I am a strong believer that you do have to have regimes and structures. And you can always come up with special cases to say, oh, well, this should be different or that should be different. And in most cases, actually, no, you have to have a consistent regime. But this is a different case. You know, the nature of the relationships between our nations and within our nations uh, means that, you know, exempting these individuals from a citizenship test that not only would be, frankly, a waste of time, but actually, as the right honourable gentleman says, in many cases, deeply insulting. That is, a, that is wise, and again, we, we very, very much support it. So I think, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, that leaves only one more point of contention, and that is of fees, as the right honourable gentleman touched on. So I too want to just press the minister a little bit on this. We know that fees in this area, the honourable gentleman mentioned, is in the region of a little bit more than £1,500. That is a significant sum uh, to anybody. Um, and I know that we're to expect that the issue of fees will be settled separately in regulations, and the right honourable uh, gentleman uh, acknowledge that too. Uh, and that will be debated in the usual way by the House. And we know that ministers have engaged on this matter, and again, we welcome that. But I wonder if the Minister might at least tell us the direction of the Government's thinking uh, in this regard, because it is significant in pertaining as to how this Bill will actually operate in practice and how accessible the provisions in the Bill may be in the future. Uh, so I wonder if, uh, if, if the Minister might just set out what further discussions uh, he and his colleagues have had since the committee stage and whether indeed the Government are working up uh, potentially agreeable solutions, uh, and particularly to test this basic point of substance, I think, uh, with uh, the right honourable gentleman, the, the, for Tombridge and Malling, um, that I think the government have accepted by waiving the citizenship test that the case involving Irish citizens is different to that of citizens of other countries who are seeking to attain British citizenship. And again, I think that is a significant point, but a point of consensus. So, therefore, does the minister? believe that that same principle can be read across on fees as well? And if so, will that give us a sense of what we might uh, expect in regulation? So I'm very keen to, he to hear from the Minister the Government's direction of travel on this and perhaps when they expect to reach their destination and have something public to share uh, about what they intend to do. So at that point, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I'm very keen to hear those reflections from the Minister and I don't want to detain the House any any further. So I will wind up there. I congratulate again the right honourable gentleman and those who have worked with him for the success with this bill so far, and I wish, wish him every luck as it proceeds to the other place. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. May I start uh, on behalf of my friend and colleague, the right honourable member of Corby, the honourable member of Corby, uh, and thank all those members across the House, and in particular the members of the Bill Committee who have engaged in debating the merits of the Bill on second reading committee and now here today at third reading. This is, as many have said, a huge credit to the Honourable Member for Belfast East. He has championed, quite rightly, the rights of people who should have those rights recognised and should have the abilities that he has set out today and indeed in past days. He has conducted himself not just alongside my honourable friend for Corby, who speaks very highly of him and has been very grateful for the engagement that he's had over these recent weeks and months, uh, but with Home Office officials in a manner that has been absolutely exemplary, has been, as uh, others have noted, uh, both persistent and diligent and indeed challenging, where uh, the answers haven't always been forthcoming quite as quickly as he would have liked, but he's, he's managed to get the right answers and he's managed to get them written down. So it's a, a huge testament to him that this bill has secured uh, cross-party support. Now, at the bill's second reading, Madam Deputy Speaker noted the good-natured and constructive debate that had taken place. And I'm very pleased to see that this has continued. I can't say I'm surprised about it. This is, in the government's view, a bill that is doing the right thing and will make a real difference to Irish nationals and to those who have made their homes here in the United Kingdom and want to take the next step to become British citizens. Now, I am reminded, as we sit here, of the words of our late Sovereign, Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth, when she spoke in 2011, I think it was, on the occasion of her state vision, visit to the Republic of Ireland, that no one who looked to the future over the past centuries could have imagined the strength of the bonds 
that are now in place between the governments and the peoples of our two nations. And I think what the Honourable Member for Belfast, the Right Honourable Member for Belfast East is doing today is making that recognition a little clearer, a little fresher, a little bit more meaningful. Now the Right Honourable, sorry, the Honourable Member for Corby also asked me to again reflect upon the unique position that Irish nationals hold within the United Kingdom. And here, I hope he'll forgive me for straying, I reflect on not uh, an arbitrary group of individuals, but my own family. Like many in the United Kingdom, I have family going back uh, to what is now the Republic of Ireland. Of course, then was the island of Ireland as part of the United Kingdom in Limerick. And indeed, my own father exercised his rights and secured a an Irish passport a number of years ago. Um, this is a connection that many of us see, not just in the living expression of our ancestry, but also in the history of freedom that our citizens have secured together. You don't need to look down many of the memorials here in England before you start seeing names that are quite clearly from the island of Ireland and realise that our shared struggle for freedom is one that is reflected, sadly, in the pain of loss of families across these islands. Now, already Irish nationals enjoy the right to work, to study and to vote, alongside having benefits such as access to our health service and social welfare. The common travel area arrangements for Irish nationals are now in statute under Section 3ZA of the Immigration Act 1971. And this protects the ability of Irish nationals to enter and live in the United Kingdom without needing a grant of immigration, leave to enter or remain. This relationship is reciprocated by the Irish Government in regard to British citizens entering Ireland, and this strengthens the relationship between our two countries. Indeed, the right to hold and to live both identities was also guaranteed in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, which many people have uh, exercised. Indeed, a member of my own private office who luxuriates under the joint nationality uh, exercises to this day. Irish nationals who are exercising their rights to live and work in the United Kingdom must currently undertake the naturalisation process to gain British citizenship. And there are many requirements associated with naturalisation, such as a period of residence, which is usually five years, and which is re replicated in this Bill. However, many of the immigration requirements in naturalisation are designed for those who do require formal grants of leave. And it is not right to fully apply this to Irish nationals seeking to obtain British citizenship. Equally so, the need to demonstrate competence of language, usually English, although Welsh and Scotch, Scots Gaelic are also options, and being expected to pass the Life in the United Kingdom test seems at odds with the position of Irish nationals in the United Kingdom, and we're glad that they do not feature in this bill. This issue has been raised in the House previously by honourable members, such as the honourable member for East London Derry. Likewise, it has been discussed by Lord Hay of Ballyor, who sits in the other place, and as a an side, as a member from Donegal, uh, another member of my private office has decided quite extraordinarily to go and run a marathon round there this weekend, for which I can only wish him uh, good luck. Yes. They have highlighted the strong feeling about the issue, in addition to the cost of naturalisation, and the Honourable Member for Corby would like to express his happiness at this Bill and the improvements it makes to our statute books. Now, whilst the Government supported the underlying principles of this Bill, full Government support was dependent on amendments to the Bill being passed. With thanks to the Right Honourable Member for Belfast East and the constructive approach which has characterised this Bill. Those amendments were readily included, and following the actions of committee members who have scrutinised and debated this bill, these amendments have passed and the Government is able to offer its full, unbridled and unconditional support as it completes its way through the House. 
and moves to the other place. The bill, as introduced to the House, allowed for only people born in Ireland after the 31st of December 1948, having then been resident in Northern Ireland for five years to register as British citizens. Of course, uh, the right honourable member and the whole House will know that before that date, uh, citizens born in the Republic of Ireland were not, of course, born in the Republic of Ireland as the Republic hadn't been declared, uh, and so they were automatically eligible for British citizenship. And as the right honourable member will forgive me for expressing, his modest initial proposal didn't recognise what I know he and I both share, which is that the United Kingdom is whole and integral, and therefore laws that apply for citizenship in Northern Ireland, as he has suggested, uh, should apply to the rest of the United Kingdom, except when a particular treaty, Good Friday Agreement, for example, uh, applies to change elements of that. So I'm glad that he has welcomed, as I knew he would, uh, the expansion of this to the whole of the United Kingdom. Following the amendments that passed at committee stage, the Bill's provisions will apply to all eligible Irish nationals of all ages who live anywhere in the United Kingdom for five years. As noted by the right honourable, sorry, by the honourable member for Corby at the second reading of this bill, the provisions to amend the bill that passed at committee stage have done this by firstly making the route available to Irish nationals, regardless of how they became Irish, and not just those born in Ireland. Those covered by the provisions of the bill, as it was first introduced, will still be included, but the bill now before the House will be more expansive in approach, in that it will give all eligible Irish nationals a more straightforward path, pathway to becoming a British citizen. Secondly, it will not have a requirement that an Irish national must have been born after a certain date. The amended bill will make it so people born on or before the 31st of December 1948 have the same opportunity to make use of this bill as people born after that date. Thirdly, qualifying residents can be from any part of the United Kingdom and not just Northern Ireland. This ensures that all eligible Irish nationals who are resident anywhere in the United Kingdom will be able to make use of this important piece of legislation. This reflects the important point that becoming a British citizen is about a tie to the whole of the United Kingdom, not just one constituent part of it, even were we to expect its uptake to be proportionately more in Northern Ireland. And I know the right honourable member for Belfast East agrees strongly with that position. Now, the bill will add a new registration route into, British, into the British Nationality Act 1981. It seeks to insert a new section for AA into the Act and would allow any Irish national who has completed the qualifying residential period in the United Kingdom to be registered as a British citizen if they apply and meet the requirements. These requirements are a period of five years lawful residence without excess absences, a specific assessment of the 12 months prior to the application of being of good character and sorry and of being of good character the secretary of state would of course still retain discretion over the residential requirements allowing him or her to treat them as having been met when they have not sorry even when they have not and where the exceptional circumstances of a particular case merits doing so in keeping with other applications for British citizenship, albeit not on the face of the bill, Irish nationals would also be expected to enrol their biometrics and, and successful applicants aged 18 or over would be required to attend a citizenship ceremony. Now, it would be remiss of me not to highlight that this bill, alongside all other residential application routes for British citizenship, is subject to the relevant sections of the Illegal Migration Act 2023, relating to citizenship applications. I do not need to revisit the Government's position in this area and as agreed by Parliament in passing the Act. Now, the question came up from my honourable friend uh, from Heinburn about the uh, reciprocal uh, requirements or rather the reciprocal requests to the Irish Government. Those are, of course, a matter for the Irish Government. But I have to say we have an extremely friendly relationship with the Irish Government and, uh, indeed, 
the elevation of the new Taoiseach uh, recent days was uh, a matter of some celebration to many of us, as he's been a friend for a number of years, and I'm sure he'll serve the Irish people extremely well, and I hope very much that uh, the friendship that we've developed over years may, may see an evolution in this area, but that is, of course, a matter for them, not for us. The Honourable Member for Corby would like to reiterate his acknowledgement that the Honour Right Honourable Member for Belfast East is not in agreement with the Government over the Act's aims. However, it is necessary to ensure a consistent approach across the statute book, even if, sorry, and here I'm of course referring to the uh, Illegal Migration Act 2023. Um, however, it is necessary to ensure a consistent approach across the statute book, even if it is highly unlikely that an Irish national would ever fall foul of its provisions. Furthermore, the Honourable Member is, for Corby is also aware and cognizant of the discussion to be had around fees for this registration route and notes the questions and comments which were rates raised at committee stage on this point. As members of this House may be aware, the unit costs for border and migration services are reviewed annually, an exercise which is currently underway following the financial year end. The unit cost for this proposed route will form part of that annual review to ensure consistency in that calculation. And once completed, the Honourable Member for Corby will be able to engage further with the Right Honourable Member for Belfast East in this space. It should be made clear, as the Honourable <coughs> Member uh, raised as well, uh, that this is not intended to be a profit scheme for the Government. This is merely intended to be a way of recognising that there is a cost, uh, and it would be right that that cost fell on those exercising uh, this right uh, and not on every citizen. This bill has enjoyed varied and cross-party discussion and debate in its journey through the House. This has facilitated the amendments passed at committee stage, which will expand the number of Irish nationals in the United Kingdom who may make use of the provisions to obtain British citizenship. From early in the life cycle of this bill, it was and continues to be the Government's belief that a dedicated route for Irish citizens would reduce the burden for such applicants and create a more straightforward route to becoming a British citizen for our closest neighbours. Now, the establishment of a dedicated route could potentially also allow for a lower fee to be charged, although I have already highlighted that this must be considered in line with ongoing work surrounding the border and migration services fees. The Government is unequivocal in its support of the underlying principles of the Bill, first introduced by the Right Honourable Member for Belfast East, and is pleased to provide its full support for the Bill following the amendments passed at committee stage and incorporated in the Bill before us today. The Honourable Member for Corby and I concur. We would like to... Con forgive me, I'm misreading myself. The Honourable Member for Corby and I would like once again to concur and to congratulate the Right Honourable Member for Belfast East on his success in the ballot and for helping the Government to find a way to correct the issue in our nationality system. Now, I personally would like to congratulate the Right Honourable Member for Belfast East and wish the bell go well as it moves through to the other place. This is an important bill, a welcome amendment to our current legislation and one that I hope will be exercised by those who have rightly and in a most welcome fashion, made their home among us and are part of our lives today. With the Leave of the House, Gavin Robinson. Well, thank you very much, Mr Deputy Speaker. And as I, I said, it's just a, a list of thank yous, uh, I think, from me. But thank you to you for your expert chairmanship uh, in this regard. Yeah. Uh, thank you to the Minister and for the way in which he has engaged and picked up the baton uh, incredibly well. I uh, appreciate that. And to uh, the, the Minister for Immigration, the Honourable Member for Corby, he has been uh, great in his engagement to the Shadow Minister from uh, Nottingham North, I think, I believe. Um, I appreciate the comments uh, that he has made. Anne-Marie Griffith from the Public Bill Office has been very forgiving uh, in the way in which I've had to continually ask questions that she's probably answered on four or five occasions previously, but I appreciate all the assistance from the Public Bill Office. Home Office officials have been uh, incredible in their uh, 
assistance and their expertise and their guidance and their encouragement and support and to Mr Darlow and his team. Um, a, a huge thanks to him, to James and my team as well for keeping me on the straight and narrow uh, and to the Honourable Lady for Castle Point. Um, Mr Deputy Speaker, I couldn't explain to you how the Honourable Lady outlined to me the stress associated uh, with organising Private Members Bill Fridays, but if you're listening to me, you might ask her uh, later on. To the Honourable Lady for Hindburn, uh, thank you for the comments, and to the Honourable Gentleman for Christchurch, um, I'm very grateful that he remembered the uh, Westminster Hall debate and um, the interactions between ourselves and the the still Minister uh, of State in Northern Ireland, but the Honourable Member for Christchurch wants to follow me in quick succession, so I shall with that uh, sit down. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you very much. The question is that the bill be now read the third time. Is Member going to say aye? Aye. no. I think the ayes have it. The ayes have it. Congratulations, Mr Robinson.